Welcome to the Dean Show. My next guest coming up from atheism to agnosticism to beauty pageants and party and play and fun to having a void that many people have filling it with all these th things, a thousand and one things, but none of these things make that pain inside, that void inside, the hurt inside, the yearning to want to know inside why I've been created, why am I here, the person my next guest found out why, and she's here to share her story and how she wouldn't trade it for the world. You can have it too. We'll be right back on The Dean Show with this wonderful story. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. This is The Dean Show. 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 This is the Dean, the Dean Show. alaikum, peace be with you. Welcome to the show, Sister Chelsea. How are you? I'm good. Wa alaikum salam. Now we hear you came. You come from a, a kind of an agnostic, atheist uh, background. You went through the whole, um, you know. And and I always wonder. I I get really um, in awe, thinking like, why is it that many young women, they inspire to be like a star, meaning like, you know, they want to win the beauty pageants, and this is kind of what you went through, right? Yes, I did. Um, I was an atheist. I want to say for the majority of my life, you know, I, I tried to attend like the Christian youth groups as a teenager, but I think it was probably more so for the wrong reasons of socializing and meeting boys and stuff like that. Um, but when I got into high school, you know, of course, I think just like a lot of Western girls, we kind of get into our looks and being social with other girls. And I started doing USA beauty pageants pretty much throughout my entire high school years. So for about three or four years. Now, now, why the whole uh, eight? Go, why'd you go towards the whole atheism uh, thing? I think for me, I always just relied on faith. And a lot of my family is Christian, and the majority of my family is Christian. And I remember just kind of talking to them briefly and talking to other Christians that I would socialize with, and everything was based around faith. And for me, I just never felt like I had it. When I was in high school, I attended like this hip hop church, and the pastor, he like rapped, and he was this white guy with like cornrows, and it was really fun. People would come and break dance, and it was a place where like teenagers could feel like they could practice their religion without being judged for being teenagers. And so it was really great atmosphere. And I remember even going to the Bible studies, and me and a girlfriend of mine, we decided that we would start reading kind of this urban translation of the Bible. And even then, I would read it and just I was never connecting. I remember, you know, being in church and singing the songs and having a really good time. But I remember like vaguely just being there one time and being like, what am I doing here? Like, I don't have faith. Like, I don't even like, I don't even know if I believe in this. And I think from that point on, I was just kind of like, well, if there is a God, <laughs> you know, He'll guide me somewhere, but right now I just, I don't believe in anything. So it really did kind of lead me to just not believing in anything, not believing that there was a God. Uh, we see a little guy back there. Who, who's that, your bodyguard? Yeah, in the future, inshallah. <laughs> What's his name? And his name is Ali. He's uh, 22 months old, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So Chelsea, so m many people, they kind of uh, go to church, slide it on Sundays, you know, it's kind of a traditional thing, family, friends. But then when you get to the concepts, you know, God being a man, uh, Jesus dying for your sins, you know, the fitra, what we call the natural inclination inside, this thing that God Almighty put in all of us, it rejects this. And then people start to question it. Many don't. They just, again, slide in on Sundays. Were you one of those that were going to church and sliding in, not questioning it? And then you came to a point where you started the question and then you were really at a dilemma here? You know, I didn't really grow up in a very religious household. Um, my father, he's kind of a bit more of a scientist. My mom, she grew up in a Christian home, but church was really just for Christmas Eve and maybe Easter's for us. Um, you know, like I said, I kind of attended your typical, like, teenage youth groups and stuff like that in middle school. Uh, but from my knowledge, I mean, I only understood Christianity to be as that uh, Jesus was the Son of God. 
Um, you know, it wasn't until later on in my teenage years that I started hearing other sects of Christianity kind of talking about how Jesus was God and that he was a man. And I think for me, I did question a lot of that. I don't think that there was ever a time in my life that I fully accepted it because I never really considered myself a Christian. Even now when people are like, oh, well, you kind of grew up in a Christian household or your family was Christian. But I never really felt Christian because I never really felt that way. I never felt that Jesus was the Son of God or I questioned it enough anyways to not really feel that way. And how, how did you get to uh, investigating about Islam? Um, you know, it was in, in high school anyways. I had a Muslim girlfriend who was a born, uh, she was Palestinian born Muslim. And um, when she was 18 years old, she ended up getting married. <laughs> My son wants to be in the show, I'm telling you. <laughs> Inshallah, when he, when he gets older, we'll get him on. We would talk briefly about Islam. Um, you know, but it wasn't anything big. It wasn't really until I was about 25 years old or so um, that I figured, you know what, I have kind of checked out all of the other religions that I was even interested in, even going into Buddhism and things like that. And, um, you know, nothing really stuck. So I kind of felt, well, I don't really have anything to lose. Me and her, we would ha kind of have like small discussions here and there. And I was always kind of like, well, if there's a God, and I think this is kind of where my agnosticism started to come in around like 24, 25, because I was always that if. I was searching for something. I, I did. I wanted something. Um, you know, I just never had faith in anything. So when she kept telling me, Chelsea, some of the things that you kind of talk about if there was a God and how life should be and how we should be as people, it really kind of sounds Islamic, you know, and... I think right then and there, I was kind of like, hey, well, what do I have to lose? You know, let me just go ahead and watch some lectures on YouTube. And that's actually what brought me to your show, alhamdulillah. I mean, I remember just watching like video after video on your video log on your website. And I would spend hours like every day for weeks doing that. Mashallah, we're going to take a break and we want to talk about this void. You had kind of went through uh, many of the, th pursuing many of the pursuits that people Young people, they pursue, but there was a void. We're going to get to that void when we come back here in the Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Please subscribe to the Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support the Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Subscribe right now. Back here on the Dean Show. Before we went off the break, I talked about a void. Many people have it. They fill it with alcohol, with drugs. They fall into peer pressure, pursuing to be a star, beauty pageants, you name it. They do it a thousand and one purposes, except the true purpose. Talk about this void that you had. Well, I think I, think I suffered from this void for a long time, not really realizing it. You know, I was that, I was the kind of girl who like, I had tons of friends, but I always felt lonely. You know, it's like I was always trying to find confidence, but I was that person that was always, you know, telling people to have self-love. Um, you know, I always felt like something was missing, and I never really knew what it was. And so for me, you know, naturally, just as like a young Western girl, you know, I lived kind of the party lifestyle, and I worked as a cocktail waitress at a bar, and... You know, so, of course, that had me out a lot. Um, I would go to the clubs. I mean, at one point, right before I converted, actually, I mean, I was going out anywhere from three to four nights a week, um, you know, and I was I was drinking a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it, ne it was never anything I felt like I had an issue with. I just felt like I was just being a young girl having fun, um, you know, and I unfortunately ended up kind of trying to fill that void with other things that I won't really, you know, go into detail about. Um, but, you know, it really just left me more empty. And I remember when I started looking into Islam, um, you know, I almost kind of started to like feel like this genuine happiness kind of start to come into play. Like things are going to be okay. And I didn't feel that in, you know, that emptiness as much anyways. And now, alhamdulillah, you know, four and a half years later after converting, 
I can honestly say that I am the most genuinely happy I have ever been in my entire life, alhamdulillah. Would you trade it for the world? <laughs> Would I trade it for the world? This happiness that you have now. Oh, no way, no way. My goal is Jenna. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, tell us also, how do you feel, especially right now when you see this beautiful way of life that was lived by Jesus, Moses, Abraham, you know, that simple call to have a, a loving relationship, to connect your heart with the Creator who created the heart, this way of life of Islam being defamed uh, by many of these politicians now. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel? How does that make you feel? You know, I think for me it's just kind of disheartening. Um, you know, I've always been a very optimistic person. I've always been somebody who really looks at the good in people, the good in society. And I truly believe that God made us inherently good. I mean, you know, we're made of light, you know. So he, he knew that there was some good in, in us. And, um, you know, so for me, Islam, you know, it's kind of one of those ignorance can create hate and, um, you know, ignorance is bliss in a way, um, you know, but it's really just kind of disheartening, I think, you know, especially for me as a woman who I wear my religion on my head, you know, and so for me with a young child going out in public, especially now, it's like there's almost kind of this level of fear that I feel is very unnecessary. And I really think that it has to do with people just being uneducated and them educating themselves in the wrong way from the wrong sources. And I think that it's really important for us as a Muslim Ummah to kind of come together and create these educational resources for these people so that we don't have, you know, these misconceptions, these misunderstandings from people. Have you ever had a real situation where someone's come up to you at random and asked you about Islam or... Uh, was inquisitive to know or gave you a hard time uh, and, you, and you had a chance to, to communicate with such a person and communicate what Islam was really about? Alhamdulillah, I, I've actually had a lot of occasions and I think that one, it's because I am a woman in the West wearing hijab. And I think that two, um, you know, oh, Unfortunately, a lot of people in, in the West do stereotype uh, Muslims as being, you know, um, a, a darker color, an Arab, an Indian, things like this. So when they see somebody like me who, you know, is blue eyes, light skin, you know, they're a little bit more intrigued and maybe even unfortunately at times a little bit more at ease to talk to me. Um, you know, I wore hijab publicly while I was working uh, before I was pregnant and a bit during while I was pregnant. Yes, Baba. And, um, you know, so for me, I encountered a lot of people asking questions about my religion, why I wore hijab, of course, your, your, your comments of, oh, did your husband make you wear that and, you know, things like that. I did, unfortunately, encounter one negative, um, you know, conversation with a young gentleman. And I think, you know, of course, as a new Muslim, you know, even at times we kind of have to learn to control ourselves a bit. And I think it kind of became a little bit more of a back and forth. And if maybe I had restrained myself a bit, maybe it wouldn't have gotten as bad as it did. But it got to the point where... You know, he was kind of cussing at me and telling me to go back to my country. And I laughed because I was like, well, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> you know, because I am white, Caucasian, American born, you know, and it, it's really sad that these people have these horrible stereotypes in their head, you know, that Islam and somehow is in relation to an ethnicity or a nationality, which, of course, we know is untrue, but... Thankfully, I have had a lot of opportunities to speak to people about my religion and kind of clear up some misconceptions, which has been really nice and I think beneficial to me. Uh, have you had family members or some of these people ask you, like, uh, so what now? You've become, you know, a, a terror, a radical. And how do you respond to that? Has anybody has associated with you now as a suspect now? Because you're Muslim, automatically they think, okay, you've become some radical extremist. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think um, even right when I converted, um, you know, I was still kind of 
going through an, an old marriage of mine um, where my ex-husband was actually a United States Marine. And, you know, so my family, of course, was very used to me being kind of in this military go America lifestyle. And so when I had told my family that I had decided to convert to Islam, I remember one family member in particular kind of came at me and was like, so then what, are you like against America now? And like, I just, it's like, I almost didn't even know what to say to that. Like, my religion doesn't make me against a country, you know, maybe some of its actions at times, but I mean, we could say that about countries all over the world. Um, you know, so for me, it's like me wearing my hijab shouldn't make me radical just because I'm choosing to, you know, follow my faith. I mean, I am probably one of the nicest people ever. You know, it's like when you actually sit down and talk to me, and this is what happened with a lot of the women who have confronted me in my past who were non-Muslim asking me questions, kind of like, you're just like a normal girl. And I'm like, well, thank you for seeing that. I wish more people understood that Muslims are just regular people and that this is just their religion. You know, and again, it just, it comes down to ignorance. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back with more here on The Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. Please subscribe to The Dean Show. Follow us on our official Facebook and Twitter pages in the links below. Please also help support The Dean Show by making a donation in the link below. Subscribe right now. Welcome back to The Dean Show. Uh, tell us, Chelsea, did you have, once you, we know that any sincere individual human being that really looks into Islam, seeking to know the truth, they will find what they're looking for in it. But many people, sometimes they have these reservations because what's my family going to say? Society, it's not the cool thing as you can see. Did you have some of these apprehensions and reservations when you start to recognize that this was indeed the truth from the Creator? You know, alhamdulillah, I think that my mom raised me to be a very outgoing and confident person. Um, I'm somebody who's always stood by my beliefs and never really cared what other people thought of me. And I think that really kind of served, you know, benefit to me in this process because when it came down to it, I didn't really care what my family had to say. Um, you know, I do encounter a lot of reverts, converts who do kind of struggle with how their family is going to react and they fear that they're going to lose their friends or their social circle and that wasn't a concern for me. My concern was finding out the truth and I'm somebody who when I want to know something I will spend all day and all night trying to figure it out. So, you know, when it came down to it, you know, telling my parents, you know, it, on one hand, it was a bit scary, you know, because I think more than anything, telling my father I knew was going to be a little bit nerve wracking because he definitely is kind of that scientist. And, you know, I was kind of on his side for many years when we would talk about religion and religious people and their actions and maybe how the church is and things like that. So, you know, his reaction was probably, you know, the most shocking out of everybody. My mom, she was really just kind of concerned for me, but... You know, for myself, I, again, I just didn't care what anybody else thought. I was happy with my choice. I did go through a little bit of anxiety here and there, you know, because I was coming from such a different lifestyle. I was coming from a lifestyle where it's okay for girls to wear mini shorts and tank tops and stiletto high heels and beautify themselves and go to the clubs and have guy friends and, you know, have your occasional glass of wine and, you know, all of that was very, very acceptable, you know, and so for me, it's like I kind of had to get myself out of that thought process and really dive deep into educating myself and Islam so that I could fully understand why I was making these changes. And alhamdulillah, I tell all the girls that I speak with, um, that I feel that God really does kind of put us in certain situations in our past to make us understand Islam a bit better. And everything that a lot of girls come to me with that they're struggling with, whether it's having guy friends or having boyfriends or stop drinking alcohol or whatever it may be, I have a story in my past that I can relate it to and understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked these things of us. 
you know, and so I think that it's been really great. I think that, you know, when a convert comes into the faith, education is the best thing to kind of relieve yourself of any of that anxiety. And when you really start to have faith in Allah and what he has in store for you and your journey, you're not going to care about what anybody else has to say. Uh, we know Islam, one of the, the main um, things that it's there for is to help us to become better human beings, to have the best manners and character, and that's all built on that pure monotheism, having a direct connection with the Creator. And everything He's told us to do is good for us, and everything He told us to stay away from is harmful for us. One of the things, after you've established that connection, the prayer, and because we need it, it's our medicine. Uh, one of the things that many women struggle with is the, the hijab. So what do you, I mean, you coming from... A, a background now that you, you know, you did, many people there, they take for granted being born into a Muslim family, you coming from uh, a, 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 a family that wasn't Muslim, and now you stepped up, you, you know, you're wearing hijab, how do you encourage those, those women out there who are having a hard time, you know, uh, with this uh, uh, wearing of the hijab, what do you usually tell them to motivate them? You know, I think that when I always try to approach sisters and, um, you know, their difficulties, you know, because we all have our own difficulties, whether small or big, they're our own and they're different. And um, I always try to kind of give them, you know, it, a very Islamic perspective. But as well, you know, I do kind of try to be sensitive to, you know, their emotion and what they're going through and kind of give them a little bit of friend or sister advice as well. Um, you know, but I think that, you know, if you're really just going to kind of spell it out, you know, one thing I really say just to dive right into it is that at the end of the day, hijab is, is a choice. If when you say choice, you mean ultimately, <laughs> Baba. yeah, Baba. here, let me give this to you. You know, if, ulti if ultimately you mean that truly, everything that you do in your life is a choice. We know that praying five times a day is something yes. that is mandated of us as Muslims. It's a part of our five pillars, but yes. it's still a choice. I mean, we can choose to do those five prayers or we can choose to do one or none. You know, so for me, it's like when talking to girls, I have to let them know, yes, hijab yes. is a choice. But it is something I truly believe is mentioned in the Quran as something that us as women need to do as Muslims. Is it as important yes. as other things like prayer? Maybe yes. not. But I think that as Muslim women, we have to recognize the things that we yes. have to do in our faith to please Allah, to better ourselves yes. as Muslims. And if we're not at least taking those steps and really truly understanding why and the fact that we need to anyways, we're not going to get anywhere. You know, so it's really kind of that understanding of it is a choice, but it's a choice that's going to be better for us and better for our dean. It's going to be better for our practice. And inshallah, you know, you may not be perfect right now, but you can work towards it. I do unfortunately have a lot of girls who kind of come to me who say, well, my personality isn't very modest, so how am I going to be modest on the outside? And I really think that just kind of comes down to education and becoming closer with your faith to truly understand what modesty is to you. Because I really do think that modesty is different for everybody. But I think that just because you're lacking in one area doesn't mean that you should totally give up on another area. You know, it's kind of about combining the two and finding a happy balance for yourself. Thank you so much for being on the Dean Show, spending time with our viewers out there. We really, um, you know, love hearing these stories of people who have been able to step up, be courageous enough, and to find peace and purpose in Islam and share their wonderful journey so more people can benefit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Stop. Thank you. Another wonderful story here on the Dean Show. You got to really be a, somewhat of an iconoclastic, someone who defies traditions. And you can't be that dead fish in the ocean, just going with the flow. Even the fish goes against many of the currents. And that's what you got to do if you want to know the truth. You got to dig for the treasure because it's worth your time. It's worth your effort. And you see what she said. She said, 
after going through what many people go through, they end up having a thousand and one different purposes, but they don't live the true purpose. And now she's found it and she wouldn't, she wouldn't trade it for the world and everything in it. And that's her story. And you can be someone out there who's going through some of the many challenges that we go through life. You will never find true, absolute happiness in this life following your desires. But, but, there's good news. And she was a, a, she's a living testimony to that. And so are the over one point, what is it, five, six billion people now out there who are, have accepted this way of life that's logical, rational, that just calls you to something very simple, to have a direct dial-up connection with the one who made you, who created you. And Jesus did it. He lived this way of life. So did his blessed mother Mary. And that's what she's doing. So now when you go ahead and look at the return on your investment, when you live this way of life, compared to living a way of life of debauchery, following your lusts and your passions and your desires, hitting this dead end, that dead end, and at the end, you just had a dead end. Call us 1-800-662-ISLAM to learn more. If you have some questions, whatever it is, let's start a healthy dialogue. Come to the Muslims to learn about this beautiful way of life that's the fastest growing way of life still in the world today because of the power that it possesses, the power to transform lives for the better, for the betterment of that individual and for the betterment of society. We'll see you next time. Until then, remember, subscribe right now if you have not. And tune in every week to The Dean Show. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. Subscribe right now.